Hello. Welcome back to section four now, elements on quantum mechanics. Let me motivate this uh, section uh, a little bit again as to why we care about quantum mechanics. We are interested in electron flow through semiconductors. We need to get to charge and to density uh, of this charge. We need to get to velocity of this charge that then flows through an area. Now, we've seen uh, different densities in the previous sections where the number of electrons uh, per atom uh, is entering through the atoms that are involved in the, in the chemical physical structure. We have a number of atoms um, per volume from the crystal structure, and uh, we are after the number of electrons that are uh, available for conduction. And uh, those numbers are different. The number of electrons available for conduction are, is not the total number of electrons in the system. And we need to understand why that is. So all the electrons per se are identical, but they don't behave the same. And we need to understand why that is. And we'll derive uh, in, the, uh, in the section five and six models for that. But here we just uh, lay some foundations on quantum mechanics and why that is relevant, etc. So that being said, we're going to look at some classical systems first to just uh, set a reminder. We'll look at some strange experimental results that really created the advent of quantum mechanics. And I'll touch a base again, why would we care? And then there's a very brief and um, uh, short formulations of Sch Schrodinger equation. All right. So let's uh, look at particles, propagating waves, standing waves, and chromatography as sort of the, the stepping stone to, to equalize the playing field a little bit and start with classical macroscopic particles. Well, that's the stuff we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Physical things we can hold in our hands, uh, cars we drive, um, they have a finite extent, they have a finite weight, and they are countable with integers with numbers. So that's a pretty straightforward uh, way of thinking about uh, macroscopic objects. Uh, they obey the classical Newtonian mechanics, and um, they interact with other particles, um, and these interactions uh, are governed by energy continuity and momentum continuity. Those are preserved uh, properties for classical particles. Now, uh, one example could be billiard balls, right? Um, uh, we have um, issues with uh, energy continuity, momentum continuity. We can use them to, uh, to go through any of these uh, properties here. All right. Now, what I'd like to categorize them as is um, that their extent is continuous, right? I mean, you can make those things of any which size you want, ignoring any atomic granularity. Uh, you can also give them any weight, and it, that is continuous, uh, again, ignoring any atomic granularity. And um, the, the, you can count them. Their things are discrete, okay? All right. Now let's look at propagating plane waves as another classical um, uh, thing that occurs in our environment. So these waves have an infinite extent as a mathematical concept. They don't start, they don't stop. Uh, they have a finite wavelength and they have a finite frequency. So we could describe a wave by, um, say, a sinusoid like this. They have a propagation constant in time and in space, and they have an amplitude. Uh, they, these waves obey the wave equation as depicted here, and a typical solution for this wave equation is a sinusoid. It could be a complex uh, exponential as well, as we'll use throughout the course a lot. It has an amplitude, it has a um, propagation vector, and has a time and space dependence. All right. Uh, we also deal with waves uh, that, and we know that they can have coherent superposition, they can interfere with each other, they can, these interferences can be constructive or destructive, and uh, one wave can cancel out another. You might actually use a noise-canceling headset anytime uh, during the day these days. Um, also, your muffler on your car is really a noise-canceling uh, device. 
All right. Uh, you might recall the Huygens principle, uh, where one wave is made up out of many uh, circular waves, and uh, waves can have diffractions, they can go around corners. And I have a, a couple of animations that remind you of this, right? So here you have an animation of a single point source of a wave, and uh, you can uh, have multiple of those point sources. If you line them from one uh, line, you can uh, naturally see how a, a plane wave emerges out of that. So any wave can be constructed out of point sources. All right. In terms of uh, the double slit experiments and uh, waves that can interfere with each other, you now see that um, here is an example of visualization. So you have a, a point source uh, that is projecting uh, onto a plane where there's two slits or two dots. Um, in this case, a double slit experiment, which uh, lets out in 2D two waves. And wave theory would then predict that you have um, interference patterns. Uh, if you had a particle theory of light, in this case, you wouldn't have such interference. You would just have uh, 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 two beams going through. And what's observed is, of course, that uh, uh, light is a wave and it interferes. And that's a very classical experiment. And it is uh, the accepted proof that light is a wave. And of course, we've gotten to understand more that it's an electromagnetic wave, etc. All right, going back to its characteristics. So these waves. Are, have infinite extent in their mathematical um, description, and that is not countable. They have a finite wavelength, and that is continuous. You can give it any wavelength, and you can give it any frequency. So your, your choice is continuous there. It's not discrete. All right, now let's look at a modification of that. Let's look at standing waves, right? So a standing wave might be looking like this, where you enclose a wave into a confined uh, region. And you can confine these uh, waves into a half wavelength or uh, a full wavelength. And that means this standing wave has a finite extent. Right? It only exists in that domain that you confine it to. And you know that it has discrete wavelengths and it has discrete frequencies. All right, even though the law of motion is the same of the other wave equation, as the, the same wave equation that we just saw on the previous slide of the propagating waves, but the solution obeys a different boundary condition. The solution is still the shape of a form of a sinusoid, but it only exists in, a, in the spatial region here in one dimension between zero and L, and outside of those regions that wave is zero. Still, this wave can have interactions with other waves, right? We know it can have superpositions. It can, uh, you can think of a sound in an instrument and in an acoustic wave. And, um, you know, a standing wave can be uh, confined or considered like a, a resonator. And one resonator can couple to another resonator. So they can exchange energy between resonators. They can be coupled. So. There would be energy conservation in those transitions and the, those couplings. And one example is the string to a guitar uh, of the, the physical body of a guitar. And these resonators can exchange energy. All right. For that energy conversion to happen, they have to be in tune. So these, we know what that means intuitively. It means uh, mathematically that the resonance spectrum has to be uh, close to identical, to be coupled. All right. Now, let's look at some of the uh, properties of these waves, right? So, uh, these waves now have a finite extent, and one can count that extent in half wavelengths. Um, we know there's discrete wavelengths, and they come for a given resonator, a resonator in integer multiples. And they come in discrete frequencies. And for any given resonator, they come in integer fractions. And given the resonator, given the boundary condition, given the medium, those integer, uh, the integers are given, but the, the fractions or the multiples of those uh, integers 
are determined by the system, meaning these are now countable entities. All right, so let's compare those three uh, particles and waves with each other. So again, classical particles have a finite extent, so have standing waves. They have a finite weight. Um, uh, the equivalent is, uh, is um, not given in, in the standing waves. But if you now also look at propagating waves, the propagating waves have infinite extent and a finite wavelength, finite frequency, but continuous of these. All I'm trying to appeal is that we compare particles and waves on, on similar concepts and we'll see later that there's something called particle wave duality where these elements cross over. All right, I'm, I'm sure you're f familiar that you can uh, split a white light through a prism into a, a spectrum of colors. You know that um, basically light is made up of many frequencies, white color is made of, uh, white is made up of many colors, and a prism can dissect it into multiple components. And if you had a continuous color uh, spectrum, that would point to uh, the white light consisting of a, con a continuous number of frequencies. All right. That being said, we're going to start looking at uh, uh, some strange experimental results that, that don't quite fit our classical understanding of uh, nature. And that'll be part in the next section. Thank you.